We're going to talk about how to measure your team's progress and impact and make sure that all stakeholders are taken into consideration. We'll talk about the list and you'll notice that the list of things that I found in the literature is actually pretty long. So evaluating teams can be very challenging. Um, as I mentioned, there's no one way to evaluate a team. It really depends on what it is you're focusing on um, for your team, whether it's satisfaction, engagement, output. Um, every team is likely to do it a little bit differently. Um, constructs like success and impact are difficult to operationalize, so to make them specific. So what do we mean by success? What do we mean by impact? And you've even seen today um, the the conversation we've had uh, where people have, you know, Petra, you asked like, what do you mean by success? And it's because it's, it's difficult to define that. Um, metrics, and we'll talk about some different ways in which to measure the metrics can be difficult to interpret. What do they really mean? Um, pathways to impact are rarely linear. I think Jim, that kind of goes back to what happens along the pathway in terms of research. Uh, confounding factors sometimes may mediate impact. You know, something that we're struggling with is that we're evaluating some teams here in ICTER, and we'd love to be able to say that collaboration planning or this workshop is having a major impact. The problem is, is that we're doing lots of things with those teams. So do how do we know if it's that one intervention that made them uh, so successful or is it a different intervention that made them successful that they took about the same time? Is it the constellation put together? So sometimes you have these other mediating factors that can make it really difficult to figure out what was the thing that made something uh, successful or impactful. There's often time lags, workshops like this. I won't know if you can, um, I'll know if you're satisfied, I'll know if you feel like you learned something, but I won't know if you can effectively implement evaluation until later on when you go to do that in your teams, it takes time. Um, uh, Petra, I don't know if this gets to your point before, but uh, team members sometimes have strong opinions and different priorities. Uh, there is pressure to perform, um, which can bring some ethical problems. And then evaluation can be expensive in terms of resources and funding. Sometimes for some projects, you have to actually pay an evaluator and you have to pull that money out of your, your direct costs. Sometimes you find a problem that you have to fix and that costs money and time and resources. Um, if you're gonna argue if and conflict invariably ensues, not always, at some point um, that takes time and facilitation and then documentation always takes time. So evaluating is and can be very difficult, um, but I think we can, we can navigate those challenges because evaluation of your team has a lot of really great benefits. So it provides a direction for your team. Once you create a mission, once you create goals, you put your team on a trajectory to accomplish those goals. Um, I said just in the slide before that you identify problem areas. And even though that can be expensive and difficult to overcome, I don't think there's anybody out there who wouldn't want to absolutely overcome those problems. So you wanna know, especially early on, so it's easier to take care of those kinds of things. It'll enhance your team processes. As we've talked before, part of the whole notion of the science of team science is not just improving your task work, which we want to do, but we also want to improve your teamwork. We want your team to work better together. It facilitates communication. Evaluation um, tools, for lack of a better way to say it, can be great conversation starters. You do a quick debrief in a meeting, then you can have a conversation about how things are going and that might become a bigger conversation that ultimately adds impact to your team. We'll see some examples of that in a little while. Um, it can help cultivate a strong culture, being willing to have these conversations openly and honestly creates that great culture, that psychological safety that we talked about a couple sessions ago. It helps improve motivation. Some people are deadline driven, milestone driven. So you're like, you're shooting for that goal. And then ultimately, our hope is that it maximizes the impact of your team, however you define that. So let's talk specifically now about evaluating your team. So one of the best ways to start is to think about the kinds of questions you should be asking. So this is going to be a whole sequence of questions. So we're going to ask why. Why is the project you're doing important? Why is your team doing the work that it's doing? 
Why are you doing this research? Who's involved and who's impacted? So who's involved in the project? Who will benefit from the research? Um, what are you planning to do specifically? Those specific aims I heard somebody mention. Um, what does success look like? What will your research produce? And then how? How can you improve what you're doing? Sort of that continuous quality improvement if you've heard CQI. Um, and how will your research have impact? And then ultimately, oops, actually that's great. So ultimately what you want is, I like to include this one, how will you tell your story? And this is something that I actually learned from my graduate advisor way back in the day when I was in graduate school. And he would always talk to me about what story am I trying to tell? I did memory and learning research with rats and mazes. Yep, people still did it and they still do it now. And um, you know, we'd find out that the rats would do something like run the maze faster. And then at the end of the day though, it wasn't important that the rat ran the maze faster. It's what story does that tell me? Does that tell me that the, the training that we did will help prevent memory disorders or so thinking about not just the, the, the detailed nuts and bolts of your goals, but thinking about that bigger story that you're trying to tell. So often when I talk about this, I talk about curing cancer and things like that, but this is benign urology. So like curing um, UTIs and things like that. So, um, or uh, other related uh, physiological problems, but what is that story that you're trying to tell and having that in mind can be really helpful. Um, so ultimately you're gonna have, if you want to put together a formal evaluation plan, these are most, uh, these are the most important elements that you need to have. So you need to know your team mission and vision. You need the details of your current project with goals. You need to know your stakeholders, who's involved, who's impacted. You need to know what research outputs you're looking for and what are your outcomes. And we'll talk about the difference specifically between outputs and outcomes in just a little bit. Are there any questions so far? Thought I'd pause. I realized I was getting going with the story myself. And so I wanted to make sure I paused. Okay. So let's talk about the mission. So a clear shared mission provides motivation for your work, clarity in communication, transparency in your roles and responsibilities, and it's a target for assessment and evaluation. So knowing your mission, you know what it is you're pointing at. And then you need to articulate the details of the project. I'm guessing that your teams have more than one project going on, um, that you have this overarching goal, but there's more than one research project. So you can create an evaluation for your team, but it's best if you're going to evaluate each project that you come up with specific goals for that project. So what's your current research question? Um, how will the project answer that question? Again, what does success look like for that project? And um, this is where we come back to sort of those NIH specific aims. So um, when you're writing a grant, you know, an NIH grant in particular, they ask that you, what is it, you have two to four specific aims and that basically you're saying that specific goal that you have for your project um, and how you're going to accomplish that goal. So you wanna make sure that you articulate the details of your project. And then you also want to make sure that you consider the every all of the stakeholders um, involved. And just thinking about you, you probably all know this, but just making sure that just reminding you of some of the stakeholders. Clearly, the funding agencies are stakeholders. Those specific aims are written for those stakeholders specifically. Now they guide your project and they help you organize your thoughts, but you're accomplishing those things because you promised that stakeholder that you would do it. Um, organizational leadership. So this is where I'm talking about deans um, and other, you know, chairs of departments, deans, leaders of institutes. Um, they may have some goals and needs for your projects, um, you know, above and beyond just what you're doing for your grants. Um, you know, they want you to contribute to the mission of the broader agency. Sometimes it's important to think about the broader academy. And here, what I mean by that is thinking about well, how will my work have an impact in the field of urology or pathology or the other fields that you collaborate with? And thinking about how it will have an impact on that broader definition is important sometimes too. 
So for us, it's how does it have an impact in the science of team science? Um, community partners. Um, many of your teams are in fact translational. And so you're working towards things with actual community members. And it's important to take stock in what their needs are and to hear from them as a stakeholder. And then team members. So I think uh, Petra and Jim may have mentioned at the beginning um, about uh, team members as stakeholders. What are their career goals? Uh, what do they bring to the table? And how do we make, how, what is the best way to meet the needs of all of the stakeholders? And so even thinking about that, I had this slide here on evaluating career success. So this isn't career, this isn't success so much for the team, but it, it's important to think about the kinds of things that go into uh, an individual's career success because it will impact the work of the team. So there's those extrinsic success factors like financial success in terms of, of uh, you know, how much money can they make in their position, uh, promotions, uh, leadership, grants and publications. These are all things, you know, early career investigators in particular, I believe all of you, many of you might be early career investigators. Um, it's very important to get publications and grants and things very early. That may be less important to more senior members who can, um, uh, who are, have tenure and things like that. So being able to meet those needs of those team members is important. Um, and then the intrinsic success factors, you know, Patrick mentioned earlier about engagement. He knows this to, his team is successful when it's engaged, when the members are engaged. And so we want to make sure that people are enjoying their work as much as they can and that they are satisfied and engaged with that work. And in fact, I'll even say that for our case scholar program here in ICTER, um, they have a segment that's called work-life balance. And they actually spend time at the end of each, or I think it's called work-life integration, which is actually an important distinction. Um, so they're trying to integrate their, their work life and their, um, and their home life, their personal life. And they spend time talking about that uh, because you can imagine as clinician researchers, you have a lot to do. And um, that can be really difficult. So you have your mission and I have to make everybody happy. Um, uh, but keeping those things in mind will ultimately, I think there are ways that you can integrate the goals of everyone so that you can create a mutually beneficial experience for team members. So let's talk a minute about some of the outputs. So asking yourself a question, what are the tangible direct products of the research project? So here's some of the more common ones. We have publications, copyrights, licenses, patents, grant applications, thinking about presentations and videos. And someone more recently reminded me, which I should have remembered since I used to work with data scientists, data sets are an important resource. And then thinking about the outcomes of your work. So the expected changes or impacts resulting from the research. And so outputs are those actual things that you're creating. The outcomes are the changes that are happening. So here's some examples of some ways to phrase that. So um, identification of a model that explains biological pathways in cancer, or it could be a different disorder. Um, so, uh, so you're changing something, you're learning something brand new about um, you're defining a biological pathway. Sometimes your outcomes can be stated very specifically. So the first one was a little bit more general. Um, the, this one is after three years, patients receiving the intervention will show improved health. Um, so that would be a change. The team will continue demonstrating satisfaction with processes and overall culture, another outcome. So you have a satisfied team. Um, team members will receive federal funding within three years, and training will allow translational scientists to be more likely to receive tenure and promotion. So these are just examples of ways in which you can talk about the outcome, the changes you're hoping to make with the projects that you're doing, the changes that the outputs will make, um, or the stories that the outputs will tell about the changes that you've made. And another way to conceptualize your um, outcomes, I took this graphic from Enola Proctor. She is an expert in implementation science. And these are some other things to think about, especially if you're doing um, interventions or treatments. So, um, you know, uh, 
Is it acceptable? Um, is this something that people will use at all? Uh, is it adopted? Um, the, so ad adoption refers to the intention or action to employ an actual intervention. So again, um, it's related to acceptability, but will people use, will people adopt this intervention um, in terms of, is it appropriate for the context that you're suggesting it for? Um, is it feasible? Is it, can this group uh, use this intervention? Um, we're we're uh, part of a project uh, assessing the feasibility of different interventions for um, uh, CTSAs like ICTER. Um, Fidelity, how, how, det um, not, uh, how, I'll just read it, the degree to which an intervention was implemented as prescribed. So how true to the original invention or intervention do you stay? Um, how much will it cost? How broadly will it be applied? And is it sustainable? Is this something that people are going to start using and lose interest and then move on? So these are some other things just to think about when you're making your plans. Um, some of these may not be applicable to you, but some of them you may find useful. So let's start talking about actual measures. And so here I'm referring to shorter term measures. And so if you think about one of the things that's difficult about, one of the things that's challenging about evaluating a team is figuring out which, which evaluations to use. And so there's um, your overall impact at the end, but then how do you measure things along the way? And so you wanna also have some of those shorter term measures. So here I mentioned milestones, or I put in SMART goals uh, because I like the idea of, of creating SMART goals for your team. I know it's kind of a, a clever way to help plan your own personal goals, but what I like about it is you want to make goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. So think about some of those specific aims you might have in your NIH grants and the milestones you have. Um, it really depends on how the kind of grant you have, often um, NIH grants are evaluated on a yearly basis. So you have to do your RPPR. Um, sometimes you might have quarterly milestones. So determining the best timing for those and then creating your goals in this specific way, this SMART goal way can help you meet those milestones. It, so it'll help you with your progress reports. And then it will also help you assess team processes. So again, you're going for research impact for the task work, so you, you, the research impact, but you also want to make sure that your team is working well together so that you get um, well more of that task work done eff efficiently and effectively. So doing some of this, like I said, you want to check in with your team. And um, debriefs are a terrific way to do this. Uh, or um, uh, so, and actually, so this is an example of a kind of debrief. And so I'm going to take a step back for just a second to give you the theory or the best practices that this specific debrief is based upon. So um, I believe in the very first session, we talked about the team science best practices. And we talked about how it's important to have a shared mission. We talked about that today. Uh, we want to have our uh, facilitated interdisciplinary conversations. We want to have a culture of trust. We want to have our robust support systems and data management systems. And next session, we're going to talk about strong leadership. But just putting these in, in the context. So what I did for a group that I was working with a couple summers ago, I just created this really quick diagnostic. So um, here's a strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree, just to make sure we're sure of what those labels are at the top. And then I asked them questions. I asked the whole team. Question, so um, do you agree or disagree? The team purpose and shared vision of success of the team are, are clear and team members understand their roles, yes or no? Do you agree or disagree? Um, does the team communicate effectively? Agree or disagree? Um, how is the culture? Is it a good one, agree or disagree? Um, so you get the idea. We went down all of those. And then I also had a qualitative section so they could talk about what's working well and where they were falling short. Now you can do something like this weekly. Um, it really depends on what it is you're trying to do. What I did with this team, it was a summer program, not unlike the program Chris is working on right now. And I did one at the beginning to get a baseline. I did one in the middle and one at the end. And um, it was interesting just doing something really simple like this. We were able to identify some problems they were having on their team. 
And so it was a team with, uh, it was a translational team of undergraduate data scientists that are creating an app. And um, they had sort of sub teams and they identified that a good handful of them said that they were not communicating effectively. And then they wrote that um, the sub teams were not communicating, they were not being transparent and that they needed to change that. And so they actually changed the way that they were communicating based on this simple diagnostic. So you are absolutely welcome to use this. If you wanna do something simpler, something very specific for your team, um, based on the, the type of work that you're doing. But I highly recommend regularly, again, you can define what's best for your team, that you check in and see what's working and what's not so you can go ahead and take action to change those things. So let's start talking about actual metrics. And I know Jennifer had brought up alternative or alt metrics. And so again, when we, we had that list of outputs, and so you're going to see that in terms of metrics, we have some of the things that you're probably familiar with here on the left-hand side. So um, traditional measures, funding, patents, uh, presentations, videos, and you added some to the list as well. Um, and then just a variety of bibliometrics. So how many publications do you have? Are you first author? Are you senior author? Um, and then they have these other measures in terms of impact factor or H index, which are indicative of essentially how often you've published and in the, in then in the types of journals that have more impact on them. Um, there's some alternative measurements as well. So there's things that are specifically called in the field of evaluation called alt metrics. Um, they, and we'll, I'll show you some examples of those, but they're how many times has a paper been downloaded from a specific site? How many times it, has it been cited or read or opened? Um, We'll talk just a little bit about social network analysis and how that may or may not be useful for your team. And then I always like to be thorough and mention electronic surveillance. So this slide is actually setting things up. So we're gonna dive a little deeper into some of these topics. So if we start with talking about basic bibliometrics, um, the definition is to, it's the use of statistical methods to analyze books, articles, and other publications, especially regarding scientific content. Um, so uh, the limits of bibliometrics, so we know it's, it's, it's a reasonable index of work that's getting done. Um, the more you publish, the more work you're doing. Um, but some of its limitations are it can be biased sometimes. Sometimes um, it's more difficult for some to get published than others. Uh, there's always a time lag, although that has improved dramatically since the very first paper I published in 1997. Um, it doesn't take as long to get papers out as it used to, um, but it still takes time. Uh, and then when you get uh, the, the measures of bibliometrics often don't tell you whether or not the paper had a positive or a negative influence or the paper or publication um, uh, had a positive or a negative influence, just that it exists. So these are some things that make bibliometrics less than ideal. So some people have started looking at these alt metrics. So novel metrics, often based on, Jennifer mentioned even social media for measuring the impact of diverse scholarly objects. Um, there's simple counts uh, that things have been cited, mentioned, or downloaded. And sometimes they do have measures of impact. And so the benefits of these, there's less time. It's almost immediate because they come from actual servers and websites. Um, and sometimes they can give you more detailed information about the kind of impact the uh, work is having. The tricky part is that they can be easy to manipulate. Um, so social media or even counts. Um, I heard back in the day um, in terms of, this is more in industry, but you get the idea where if, I think on Google, the things that pop up at the top are the things that most are most commonly searched. And so when you're dealing with commercial project products, if you have people go in and search purposefully regularly, then you can get those things to pop up to the top, whether or not they're popular items or not. And those are the kinds of things that in theory could be happening um, with alt metrics as well. So let's dive in and look at some of them. So this first is a paper I pulled up from uh, the Public Library of Science, the PLOS, just to show you. Uh, so on their, on their website, so here's the article. And then over here on the right-hand side, you see some of their alt metrics. You can see that at the time I, I took this screenshot that nobody had saved this paper and nobody had cited it yet, but it, which now it makes me sad for the paper. But um, uh, hopefully since then that's happened because you want to be cited. But, but what I will say is you had uh, 2,226 views and 51 shares. 
And then this site is kind of fun, if nothing else. Um, I, I mentioned I actually remembered the first paper that I wrote because I plugged it into this Connected Papers website. And so you can put in a particular uh, publication and it links uh, papers that precede it and papers that are that cite it. And it was kind of fun to see that this paper that I wrote about beta amyloid and there's my eight arm radial maze that I mentioned before. And um, just to see uh, who cited it and um, the relationship of the papers to that. So again, I'm not sure exactly what this tells me per se. It does tell me that apparently people have cited it since I wrote it, even though I left the, that particular field. So that was kind of nice. Um, I, I can see uh, that I recognize some of the names of people that I worked with or people that I knew. So Mike McDonald was a co-author on the paper and you can see some of his preceding articles had contributed to that. Um, and you can see that uh, it has moved on with some of these other researchers. So had I stayed in the field, it might be interesting to see on this visual representation um, uh, who ran with the citation later on or who used the citation later on. So I put this out here as another example. Um, <laughs> another example of if you wanna procrastinate and you don't wanna do your grant, you can plug your publication in here and check it out. Um, you can use it to see, like I said, who's who's part of the conversation, at least in terms of publications. And the other reason I do it is it's it's a lovely segue um, into uh, talking about social network analysis. So this is specifically about the publication and the and the publications that come before it and the publications that come after it. When you're talking about social network analysis, what you're really doing is you're measuring the strength of and the pattern of relationships within a given network. So before it was about the writing and the stories that were being shared in written form. Uh, social network analysis is who's talking to who, who has what resources and how are they communicating? And it's a really effective um, descriptive tool in particular. So um, you can tell I was a child of the 70s and a big Star Wars fan. And so uh, if you look at the example in the top right corner, um, I would ask the question, um, what does this what does this picture tell you about how people are communicating? Han Solo seems pretty central to what's going on. Anybody notice that Yoda really only talks to Obi-Wan, Luke and R2-D2? So he's sort of a lone guy over there. Those are the big take homes for me. Let's jump to the ones, the purple ones on the bottom. So um, you'll notice that the purple ones on the bottom tell us a little more succinct stories. So this one over here tells an interesting story. It tells us that on this team, there are two very central people that seem to be disseminating most of the information and resources in sort of a fairly evenly distributed way Except for this guy, I'm not sure what's happening here, but um, a fairly distributed even way with the rest of the team. But it looks like the information that you're getting is going through those two individuals. And that might be something that's interesting to you about your team. You'll notice that this one's a little different. You have this sort of distributed node, same kind of model um, as the one over here. But then notice there's also sort of like a sub team over here where they uh, connect more closely with each other and seem to be a little more integrated. Um, and this one, I, I don't have a great story about this one. Um, it shows that there's a lot of collaborating. It does tell me that there's at least one or two individuals that might be key or that might be not as much of part of the team. And that would also be worth knowing if there's anyone on your team who feels uh, who's not interacting. Um, so what this can do is it can identify the sources of the power and strength in your team, and it can look for areas of weakness. So I don't know if this is a tool that would be of use to you, but there's some ways in which you could do it. Um, so Jennifer did a, a publication like the Connected Papers uh, social network analysis. Um, often social network analysis is based on self-report of who's talking to whom. There are some nor more recent uh, studies where they actually have sensor badges. So this is when people were in person a lot and we're going back in person where they wear a badge and they can measure who's where and who they're talking to. Um, and so then you don't have to be have your information based on self-report. And then we also can derive information from social networking sites and social media um, and emailing uh, so that you can figure out who's communicating with whom. And at least you can do it instead of self-report or you can use it as an additional 
piece of information to backing up that information for self-report. I'm guessing that most of you probably aren't going to use this, so I'm just putting it out there as an idea, um, but just something, just, just something interesting to share with you. So just talking about different ways to think about um, measuring impact. There's a translational science benefit model that was put forward by uh, Luke and colleagues, I believe. And um, it's a model where they talk about, you'll notice you see some of these things, either it's the resources. We didn't really talk about the resources that went into the project because we were focusing on measuring, but you want to keep in mind, what are the resources you need for your project? That is an assessment um, that needs to be made. What are the specific scientific activities? What are the outputs, the outcomes? And then here on the right-hand side has to do with that impact. And so you could ask yourself, is there a clinical impact? I think Jim, you just described that. Will you cure a disease? Will this uh, treatment be effective? There can be an impact on the community. Um, does that improve people's lives? And the economy, is the research you're doing, will it save money? Um, and then policy, will it change the way in which organizations, for example, like a hospital do things? And so those are some ways in which to think about um, the impact as a broader term, as opposed to, did you, did you accomplish the specific aims of your project? To sum up what we've talked about today, we talked about establishing and aligning your, uh, to your team mission, articulating your current project goals, identifying and engaging your stakeholders, including your team members, all of your team members, um, a funding agency team members, community members, determining the outputs and metrics that are most useful for measuring team process and team impact. Um, and here are some examples, defining your outcomes. And then we can ask the one next step you can take to measure your team's success. We do have a community of practice coming up on June 19th. It's an hour long session uh, where it'll be similar to what we're doing now. Um, and if there are topics, if you plan to attend and there's topics you know you want to cover, let me know. Otherwise, I will come and we'll uh, prepare with case studies and some additional information. This was the fourth of our five. So our final workshop session will be July 10th, and it will be on leading your team to success. Uh, these slides will be available to you probably later today. Um, and so there's references and some links to um, some of the resources I shared with you. Thank you so much for your time and energy, and I hope to see you in a few weeks or in July.